Check, check.
testing. If you want to grab yourself something to eat, grab a cookie and something to drink, uh, we're going to get going in about two minutes. All right, I think we're going to get started. So if you want to just uh, grab something to drink or eat, we're going to settle in. So good evening and welcome to Moraine Park Tec Technical College's West Bend campus. I'm Pete Rettler and I serve as campus dean. Uh, tonight is week two of the 9-11 lecture series. We're very pleased to be able to host the 9-11 lecture series with, in partnership with Kewaskam Remembers 9-11 uh, Memorial. Uh, as I stated last week, and those of you that were here last week, you're going to have to listen to the same thing for four weeks in a row. But uh, about two years ago, I met Jerry Ghost at a United Way event, and we discussed how Moraine Park might be able to help with the 9-11 memorial that is under construction in Kewaskam. Uh, Jerry introduced me to Gordon Haberman, and we started brainstorming. We found many opportunities for our students to partner in the areas of carpentry apprentices, welding and fabrication, and interactive media. And then we also started talking about the lecture series that we do in February. There are many people that help put this series together, uh, but I want to point out three in particular. Uh, those being Jerry Ghost and Gordon Haberman uh, came to many, many meetings, and everything was arranged by uh, uh, my assistant, Terry Mullaney. And uh, she kept us on track and took all the minutes, and let's give them a round of applause. Finally, it was a goal to offer this series for free, and I uh, want to uh, thank some sponsors who helped make that happen. Uh, Tom Moyer with The Candy Man, uh, Mike Chevalier with MCR Electrical Services, Jim Sprouse with Property Loss Management, Al Young with Dunn Brothers Coffee, and finally Kelly Boone with the Washington County Fair Park and Conference Center. So thank them very much, and make sure you patronize their businesses. Uh, we are also, I'm going to list, uh, list this right now, the sponsors, uh, we're live streaming on uh, WashingtonCountyInsider.com, and uh, uh, the sponsors for the live stream are West Bend Elevator, Property Loss Management, Maury's West Bend Honda, and Colette Systems. So at this time, I'd like to introduce tonight's uh, MC, 
Uh, Eric Bilstead is the executive producer of news at WTMJ Radio in Milwaukee. Eric, a national Edward R. Murrow Award winner, has worn many hats during his tenure at WTMJ, including anchoring newscasts and reporting. In 2018, Eric was instrument, instrumental in the station's Raise the Beam project, which helped raise $40,000 for the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial in Kewaskum. Eric and his wife and three children live in Menominee Falls. Let's give a warm West Bend welcome to Eric Bilstead. <laughs> Hello, hello. Good evening. Yes, um, happy to be here, very proud to be here. I'm honored to be asked to be a part of all of this. Um, obviously, it's, a, uh, it's every Thursday in February, so this is just one. This is week two of week four. A um, couple of quick reminders. We had been asked about this. So yeah, this is streaming on WashingtonCountyInsider.com. It's also being archived on that site as well. So if you missed last week, if you missed Mike, or if you're going to miss one in the future, you can always watch it on that website. It will be archived. So it's not a live stream only. It's a live stream and also posted on there. Um, I met the Hoppermans years ago, but really got to know them in 2018 because of the, the memorial. And if you have not been in Kewaskum, I encourage you to go and to see the, uh, the start of the 9-11 memorial. It's, we're only in the phase one right now, and there are many phases, and if you can make a way over there and, and help with that project, it is really quite remarkable, and it's, it's awe-inspiring to see that many people in a community coming together, not just in Kewaskum, not just in Washington County, but from all over the place, coming together for that. I just, it, it's awe-inspiring. Uh, tonight's featured guest is Mary Kohler. She's the Secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Veteran Affairs. As secretary, she serves as the chief advocate for the more than 350,000 veterans of Wisconsin and their families. Mary is the executive leader of the state agency that includes the Wisconsin Veterans Homes, Wisconsin's Veterans Memorial Cemeteries, Wisconsin Veterans Museum, and a host of programs, benefits, and services available to veterans and their family members. Secretary Kohler served 28 years in the Navy, both pre and post 9-11. And tonight she is here to share her experiences with us and to talk about how serving veterans has changed in recent times given current events. There will be a Q&A after she is done speaking, so if you have any questions, feel free to hold on to those and we'll get to them after she's done. So please join me now in welcoming the Wisconsin Department of Secretary of Veteran Affairs, it's Secretary Mary Kohler. Thank you for having me here this evening. I am quite honored to join you, and uh, whatever I can do, I hope I can assist for the creation of the memorial. I appreciate the community effort that it takes and um, the dedication and commitment to ensuring that it will happen. So again, thank you for coming. And some of you have already heard me comment that when I parked the car tonight, I said, would I come out here to hear me speak? So. Thank you, thank you for being here. I, you're hearty Wisconsin people, which I appreciate. So as you have heard, I'm Mary Kolar. I'm Secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. And so veterans and their families contribute to communities in many important ways. And it's my job as Secretary of the WDVA to make sure that we help them achieve their goals. Employment, education, and quality of life. It's all attainable in Wisconsin, and I expect WDVA to help. I have spent much of my life in military and public service. As Eric said in my intro, I spent 28 years on active duty in the US Navy until I retired. In my retirement, I served six years as a county board supervisor and only resigned from the board because of my duties as secretary. My family and I, we appreciate and have committed ourselves to service to others. My grandfather served in the Army. My father and two oldest brothers served in the Navy, one in the Air Force and one in the Marine Corps. My husband served in the Navy. Our oldest son is currently serving in the Navy and our youngest son is a firefighter. My mother, after the death of my father when I was two years old, 
became the single parent of seven children. Yet she was also committed to her community, her country, and serving veterans. I grew up in Wilton, Wisconsin. It's about a 20 minute drive from the Veterans Administration Hospital in Toma. One way we supported the veterans there was to sing. My mother, my sister, and I would be accompanied by a Catholic nun as we sang the songs for the veterans of earlier conf conflicts that they would appreciate. You Are My Sunshine is still one of my favorites from that time, and I appreciate the memories of the veterans singing along. Though the percentage of women serving in the US Navy when I joined was less than 10%, it was the promise of adventure and seeing the world that led to my commission as a naval officer. For 28 years, I enjoyed serving and working with all facets of the Navy. I also had opportunities to work with all the US military services. My first duty station after being commissioned was at a command where we tracked satellites and other things in outer space as I served as a drug and alcohol program advisor and a legal officer in a helicopter squadron. I was an instructor and company officer for newly commissioned staff corps officers, including doctors, lawyers, nurses, and other staff corps officers. Also during that tour, I completed a master's degree in adult education during my off-duty hours. Next, I was assigned to the Wargaming Department of the Naval War College as staff, and then I was able to be a student there and earn my second master's degree in national security and strategic studies. In Washington, D.C., I was the commanding officer of the enlisted personnel assigned to Naval Criminal Investigative Service. You may have heard of NCIS. It's not really true on that TV show, just saying. So but it's entertaining. Anyway, from there, my family and I moved to upstate New York to support Navy nuclear power training in Boston Spa, New York. With subsequent moves between the Midwest and the East Coast, I was trusted with more and more responsibility. A highlight was to serve as the executive officer of Recruit Chaining Command, Great Lakes. This is where my September 11th story takes place. But let's back up one day. On September 10th of 2001, I was able to leave my office at lunchtime and drive down the road to one of my favorite places. Just a few miles away was a family-run open-air market, Amade Mercatino. I don't remember what else I bought that day, but I did buy some beautiful gladiolas to place on the receptionist desks outside my office. My office was at Recruit Training Command Great Lakes in North Chicago. Again, the Navy's only boot camp, and I was the executive officer. On September 11th of 2001, I was the acting commanding officer of Recruit Training Command, or RTC as we called it. At the time, we were training 50,000 recruits per year. On this particular day, there were about 10,000 recruits in training and over 1,000 active duty staff members leading, training, and supporting the mission of RTC. My boss, Captain Ed Gant, was at the Pentagon for meetings that week, and that is why I was the acting commanding officer. The admiral, who we reported to, was also located at Great Lakes. But the admiral who had been our boss was fired the Friday before. The new admiral, Rear Admiral Dan Kleppel, began his assignment on that Monday. On an incredibly beautiful Tuesday morning, I was having our weekly meeting with senior RTC staff. With a knock on the door, Lieutenant Eric Goronik interrupted the meeting to tell us about the planes flying into the World Trade Center buildings. Like most anyone else who witnessed the tragedy and destruction of that day, we couldn't believe it. 
but it was true. We needed to be certain we and all who we were responsible for were safe. With the team of Navy professionals we had at Great Lakes, we were safe. And we continued our mission as we also adapted to the higher level of security procedures. Thankfully, Captain Gant was at a different part of the Pentagon than the side that had been hit by an airplane, and he was not harmed. Once we reestablished contact with him, we kept him updated on our acti command activities, and I continued to serve as the acting commanding officer in his absence. Coincidentally, Admiral Kleppel's wife, Deb Kleppel, was talking to her husband that Tuesday morning as she was about to attend a meeting at the World Trade Center. She literally had her hand on the door of a skyscraper when one of the planes flew into it. We kept the Admiral's staff informed of RTC staff, RTC status, while the Admiral had to deal with the loss of communication with his spouse and not knowing if she was harmed. Thankfully, by the end of the day, he was able to talk to her and confirm that she was okay. At RTC, the first week was obviously most stressful as we adapted to additional security measures that needed to be followed as we continued to train recruits, all the while experiencing the stress and worry of what would happen next. Throughout the week, as we dealt with the unknown while fulfilling our mission, every time I walked by the receptionist's desk outside my office, I saw those gladiolas, a reminder of how beautiful life can be, even in the worst of times. I was able to give Admiral Kleppel an orientation tour of RTC that week. I was so thankful that he was the senior Navy leadership presence we had during an unprecedented time in our lives. He was calm and engaging despite what he had personally experienced. Every week at boot camp, we have a graduation. Thousands of friends and family members come to see their new sailor. Recall that that week, travel by air was not possible and other transportation options were also difficult. Communication options were limited. How could we adapt at RTC? Cancel graduation? The milestone ceremony recognizing the start of a Navy sailor career? We made the decision to hold graduation. I will say, I just need to say, this is a special graduation ceremony on the 100th anniversary of Gate Lakes. We don't typically have it outside, but it's a picture to give you an example of, of the thousands of recruits who graduate in the summer months. So we had to have graduation. We would have people coming. We made the decision to hold graduation anyway. We would allow anyone who showed up to enter contrary to our higher security level. Usually, as I mentioned, thousands of people attend a graduation ceremony. For the few who showed up, maybe 100, they were a part of the new sailors' memories of the beginning of their career in a nation much different than the one that had been, it had been when they left their home nine weeks earlier. One thing the sailors would learn is how small the Navy is. It's amazing how many people you get to know and the joy of meeting again, even decades later, of not seeing one another. But we also know people in harm's way. Though we have an incredible safety record, we experience the loss of shipmates through training, operational, and conflict actions. On September 11th of 2001, we lost shipmates, friends, friends of friends, and family members. 
We trained and had graduation despite all that happened that week. We also needed to take the time to mourn and remember. We decided to have a memorial service at the recruit chapel after Friday's graduation activities. Late Friday morning, I once more traveled down the road to Amade's. Orietta was the matriarch of the family. With grandmotherly presence, she was just the person I needed to see that day. I told her how much throughout all we had experienced, I appreciated seeing the gladiolas I had purchased from her on Monday. I also told her about the memorial service we were about to have. She reached for and gave me a bouquet of red gladiolas to place on the altar. To this day, I remember those gladiolas and what they represented. Yes, the pain and the sorrow, but also the beauty of life that remains while we who are still alive fulfill our duties. I served for, in the Navy for seven more years after that fateful day, recruiting and training personnel for a new global landscape. Many other Wisconsin veterans experienced change as a result of the events of September 11th of 2001. I would like to share a couple of them with you. Jeff Carnes, a Jefferson, Wisconsin native, joined the Army in 1997 and trained as an Arabic linguist. At the time of his enlistment, it was not a specialty in high demand. As a member of the 101st Airborne, he deployed to Kosovo in 2000 and took part in peacekeeping operations there. When his tour ended, he returned to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. He remembers being woken up on the morning of September 11th to the news of the first tower being hit. Within hours, the whole post was barricaded and troops were mobilizing, and he knew that his life had changed suddenly and dramatically. Carnes did not deploy to Afghanistan, where the Taliban spoke mostly Pashtun, not Arabic. Instead, he deployed to Iraq in 2003, where his role as an Arabic linguist proved absolutely vital to communicating with locals and gathering important intelligence information. Following his overseas tour, Carnes joined the Army Reserves and spent time teaching the next generation of Arabic linguists. For others, like Laura Naylor of Wapaka, Wisconsin, who had just joined the Army National Guard at the end of her freshman year at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the spring of 2001, September 11th meant a completely changed perception of what it meant to volunteer to serve. Laura says, I didn't know what I wanted to do that summer. I couldn't afford to stay in Madison and pay for college and an apartment, and I did not want to go back to a small town in Wisconsin. So I decided to join the National Guard to help pay for school and to have some adventure in my life. And that was six months before September 11th. So I had no idea there was an impending war. For Naylor, that fateful Tuesday morning was a flurry of emotion. Having just returned from boot camp less than a month before, the reality of military service took on a whole new meaning. As she describes it, I ran into the living room and watched the second plane hit the other tower. My world shattered before my eyes. What have I done? I might have to go to war. Naylor's National Guard training routine changed to reflect the new reality as they prepared for eventual combat. In March of 2003, her unit was called up for active duty and she deployed to Iraq. The unit's original six months 
of tour of duty turned into 16 months after several extensions. But she finally returned to the States in the summer of 2004. I share these stories to give you a small sample of how the events of September 11th affected the lives of Wisconsin military service members. Post 9-11 service members participated in a different kind of war than those who served in Korea, Vietnam, and World War II. We had more women serving. Because of medical advances, we're able to quickly treat some injuries that we hadn't been able to previously and prolong lives. Technology gives us more news, photos, and videos that the public can see in real time. As a state and as a nation, we've had to adapt to how we interact with, assist, and support these individuals who are now our nation's newest generation of veterans and their families. When Jeff Carnes came back from Afghanistan, he took advantage of education benefits offered to veterans. Carnes used his veterans benefits to attend the University of Wisconsin or Madison, where he graduated with a degree in linguistics. Naylor's experience in Iraq changed her. Suffering from PTSD, Naylor sought help from the federal VA and was able to work through the struggle of adapting to her, her new normal life. With the help of her comrades, family, and medical professionals, that care for our veterans, she was able to return to a bit of her old self. Four years after she returned home from Iraq, she recognized how important it is to share her story and to help others understand the changes that our veterans go through. She says, it's been a very hard journey and that's why I like sharing it with people, so they can realize what it's really like for some people. And Laura has even written a book about her experience, which I have a copy of. And I understand she's going to be a future speaker here as well. Since 9-11, <clears throat> we focused more on mental health. Wisconsin has created a program where we literally have staff out on the streets, looking under bridges, along rivers, to find veterans who are experiencing mental health and substance abuse challenges, so we can connect them with services. Through the actions of these dedicated WDVA employees, working with county and tribal veteran service officers and others, Veterans contemplating suicide have been helped to find successful alternatives. We've also worked on ways to build a support system for women veterans. There are 30,000 women veterans in Wisconsin. We have built a network of women veterans that continues to grow so that women can talk about issues important to them specifically, seek help, and learn from one another as well as allow us to help ensure they have access to resources. We seek healing for individuals who have experienced military sexual trauma or have traumatic brain injuries. While the federal VA is responsible for providing mental and physical health care to veterans, because of these and other health issues, the WDVA has had to change how we are providing care in our Wisconsin veterans' homes, 24-hour skilled nursing homes that we oversee. For instance, we focus more on memory care and create specific care plans and living situations for those who suffer from PTSD and other mental health issues. We've created benefits like the Wisconsin GI Bill, which went into effect in 2005. 
the Wisconsin GI Bill goes above and beyond the federal GI Bill in providing full tuition to in-state university or technical college for eligible veterans and their family members. These are just a few examples. Before I close, I'd like to highlight the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, which is in Madison on the Capitol Square. The stories I've shared about Jeff Carnes and Laura Naylor came from their collection. Every veteran is a story. And the phenomenal staff at the Wisconsin Museum do all they can to collect stories like these and artifacts that help tell the stories of Wisconsin's men and women who have served. This evening, I have told the stories and experiences of 9-11 and some of what has changed since then. Of those I mentioned from RTC, Eric Goralnik is now Dr. Goralnik medical doctor and a nationally and internationally known expert on emergency preparedness and mass casualty response. Captain Ed Gant retired from active duty but continued to serve as a Naval Junior ROTC instructor. He also participates in Civil War reenactments as a member of the Union Army Colored Soldiers Units. Dan Deb, yeah, Dan and Deb Kleppel continue to serve veterans and their spouses through Corporate America Supports You and their Military Spouse Corporate Career Network. Like them, I'm honored to continue to serve. Thank you for inviting me to join you here tonight. I welcome your questions. I just want to point out before I start with questions, <clears throat> this photo is of uh, a memorial service we had at Recruit Training Command in September 11th of 2002. And when I talk about 10,000 recruits, that's 10,000 recruits attending the memorial service. That's me right there. So, <laughs> so. Anyway, your questions, I welcome. Uh, I can Hello, Chuck. I can start off if that makes uh, it a little bit easier. Did you notice at all a change in the demeanor of the recruits that week of 9-11 or in, in the days and weeks to follow? Was there more anxiety or more belief or, or any, any type of change at all? I, I would say the change is the coming together that, uh, you know, they knew that there was a crisis. Uh, probably service in the military became much more real. Uh, recruit division commanders, RDCs as we call them, are with them 24-7. And so I know that they were there to answer any questions. I think that was part of the thought process also of why we needed to have graduation to have the routine, but also we will continue and we will serve. Post 9-11, I, I um, was responsible for Navy recruiting in a 15-state region. And you definitely have people, I still read about the people who joined the service because of 9-11. If anyone has any questions, we do have a mic here. Just go ahead and raise your hand. No question is a, a bad question, of course. Uh, did we see an increase in people enlisting or wanting to be a part or interested in that post 9-11? Definitely. All, uh, in all the services. Yeah. Uh, so again, I've had tours where I've worked with all the services. You collaborate also. Uh, I had a... Um, I, I'll just say, yes, everyone saw, and then it's just become, are you physically qualified and academically and um, any, qualified to be it? But definitely, it brought more people in. Has the training changed at all, or the strategy of the training, just given the fact that the, the life was a little bit different after that? Oh, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> Nora, Laura Naylor talks about it in her book, about how their training changed. They were... And I would say all the services had to adapt to the training. When we talk about Jeff and he's um, speaking Arabic, but yeah, adapting to the change of services. Even because I was still at RTC 
uh, finding people who could speak the different languages that if they volunteered, they went to a, uh, serve somewhere else. Right, hold on, we'll get you the mic there. there okay. I, was a, I was a drill sergeant post 9-11. And it, um, prior to 9-11, you know, you didn't do a lot of the NBC uh, nuclear chemical biological stuff. Um, but the convoy training, you know, because we were doing convoy training in Iraq, so that all changed. Uh, a lot of things changed post 9-11 when it came to training. Uh, and how you trained, the 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 realism. Uh, even when you mobbed, things changed. So mo when you mobilized, you know. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, yes. I'm still in the army, so I still I still there got you go. the, I still and got. And I I just got struck to think of how things change in our training at RTC, and uh, I just also remember Captain Gant. We. The Navy put a lot of money into training prior to 9-11, so thankfully, because we had really good facilities. And they were, I mean, literally, we had training where very creative people. We were supposed to have a flame, so people with theater background know you, you put orange light on a sheet and blow it. And it we didn't have to do stuff like that anymore. We, we could build mock-ups that really looked like Navy ships. And yeah, so uh, a blend of both. Wait, hold on, grab the mic so the people on the stream can hear you. There was abundance of money. So the money, like she was saying, the realism of training changed because of the money that was pushed to the services for realistic training. I'll just say, and we got so much attention. Graduations after that, people were, you know, from D.C. that were just falling over themselves to come. I have escorted Donald Rumsfeld. I escorted... Uh, no, just, I'll just go on. We just had so many people that would come, Secretary of the Navy, to attend graduation. You were mentioning that he, uh, the one specific um, soldier, was uh, learning Arabic. Was there a, a language yeah, either before or after that became one that was targeted as far as what, what we needed to learn or how we needed to communicate with some of those folks? Uh, he was Army. Do, 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 would the Army like to answer that? So yeah. there's, a linguist, there's, yes. there, there's a linguist school in... Uh, Thank no, you it's for, actually no. in um, California. Monterey, California. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they teach like multiple uh, languages there, but mostly Arabic. And, so, and he didn't, <coughs> excuse me, speak Arab, or he didn't speak Pashtun, but I'm pretty sure that sailor who we ha had spoke Pashtun. Yeah, you're going over to Afghanistan. So the different languages, definitely sure. it changes. Uh, you know, w earlier in my career, if you were a Russian speaker, you were golden. And then all of a sudden, oh, we don't need Russian speakers. We need Arabic and the, other Middle Eastern Most languages. of the time you use interpreters anyway. So the amount of actual linguists inside the actual unit was very, very small. I, I would say it's more the intel types that are monitoring things. Any other questions? Just keep them coming. We got a couple of experts here, so we're in pretty good shape. <clears throat> I've got a question about servicemen coming home with PSTD. Is that on the rise? Is, it seems like you're hearing more and more about that, and, and are more people uh, coming home with that, or is it just being identified better now than it was years ago? Being identified more, I, I'm really glad you asked the question. Even when I give a speech, and it's like a veteran, is sitting next to you. You know, a, a veteran is sec to, I don't want to, to uh, accelerate veterans only being recognized or, oh, that's a veteran, that's a person with PTSD. But we do have to deal with people who have experienced PTSD. And we do, and I think it's more an effort to have people be comfortable with saying, I have PTSD. Our homes, <clears throat> our veterans' homes, we have people able to tell the story of their World War II, Vietnam, Korea experience because they're sitting next to a fellow veteran. They have never been able to tell that. We literally have family members say they never heard their loved one's story until that person became a resident of the veteran's home. So we as a nation 
federal VA, WDVA, uh, a, a many, a multitude of nonprofits to help a person that's ready. That I, I have this issue with PTSD, I need help. Our Veterans Outreach and Recovery Program coordinators that I was mentioning, the program that we have, when I say they go out and find veterans, that's literally what they do. And it's developing a relationship of trust. So whether it is PTSD or other challenges that resulted in that person becoming homeless, they developing that trusting relationship and working with others, get them the help they need. Again, whether it's from the federal VA, the state, or other nonprofits. Would you say that that is your biggest challenge, the PTSD or the, uh, the, the struggle with mental health, or are there others out there? I, I'd say we deal with whatever, that we're prepared, um, and again, working with the federal VA. Uh, when I, the reason I emphasize federal VA, because WDVA, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm still, I don't know if anyone else has this, I'm on my fourth <laughs> week of this class. But um, to, to get whatever it is, for mental, physical, financial, that we're here to get the help. Uh, Steve and I were talking quite a bit about how we work with a multitude of people to get the help they need. If it's PTSD, if it's mental health issues, financial issues. Uh, I appreciate everyone being here tonight and hearing about veterans because we talked about one of our biggest challenges. We have veterans who say, I don't, I don't need that. People who veterans who for, oh, I wasn't in combat, so, you know, i do not entitled. Yes, you are. You have a DD-214. Yes, there's different definitions of a veteran by the state, by the federal government, but sit down with a county veteran service officer, a tribal veteran service officer, call 1-800-WIS-VETS. It's up in our um, Facebook page, anything, too find out the services that are available to veterans and their families. Wisconsin GI Bill, that can be used here. It's also available to eligible family members. So you, a veteran, decide, I don't need to go to school, or what about your child? Take advantage. Wisconsin is one of the most generous states in the country for veterans and their families. Find out what you're eligible for. And, and again, if you're not a veteran yourself, you know one, Remind them of that. Secretary Kohler, I'm happy that you came and agreed to speak here tonight. Uh, I'm Steve Pepper, uh, student veteran specialist here at uh, Moraine Park Technical College. Um, and I just want to kind of commend everything that the WDVA does. Uh, they work tirelessly to support veterans throughout the state. We are, I think by far, we offer 21, 22 different, different benefits out of the 25 that are available. Uh, across the nation, so WDVA does an excellent job. And it's just getting the word out to everybody. Um, having services specifically to each one of the campuses and getting those individuals to open up, up about their service and kind of admit that they're veterans. There are a lot of veterans that don't even come out and say, I've served. One, because of the stigma of PTS, and two, you know, they don't, some of them are uncomfortable about being thanked for their service. So one of the services that I provide is to welcome those, uh, not only the veteran themselves, currently service members in the uh, National Guard and Reserve, but the family members and dependents, like you said, Secretary Kohler, uh, just to kind of add to the, ben the, the, uh, the benefit of Wisconsin GI Bill, <clears throat> or clarify, I should say, is that the Wisconsin GI Bill is eligible for dependents and family members if there's a service connection disability to the veteran themselves. So it's 30% uh, or more, uh, and then they would be eligible to have that benefit as well. So that is available to any of the 16 tech colleges or any of the UW schools. It pays up to 128 credits for tuition. It doesn't pay for books. It doesn't pay some of the fees or housing like the Wisconsin GI Bill pays. But uh, again, I commend all the work that the WDVA does. I work hand in hand with the county veteran service officers or the CVSOs, as many people know them. Um, and it's just glad to see the turnout that we have here. And also spreading the word about 9-11 and the commission that's uh, generating the memorial in Kewaskum is to get the word out to other eligible veterans that we have services out there and that WDVA is there to stand behind you. Thank you, Stephen. Again, I 
thank you for the emphasis on what you're eligible for. But instead of a veteran already disqualifying him or herself, go find out. Uh, we do have different definitions. One of the worst things I had to do was we had a veteran that was getting care at the federal VA hospital, but by our Wisconsin definition, because you know, his family wanted him to be in a home, one of our three homes that we have in Wisconsin, we have Chippewa Falls, King, and Union Grove. I had to say no. It's a state statute. The, the qualifications that this person, his veteran status, was not eligible by Wisconsin. But sit down with your county veteran service officer or call 1-800-WISVETS and find out what you may be entitled to. Because if you're eligible, you're pushing money away. Don't do that. Yes. Wisconsinites uh, enlisted after 9-11 or have served in conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, yeah, really wherever. Good, really good question. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but we do have the numbers of how many uh, World War II, we're, we're losing them sadly, but Vietnam, Korea, and post 9-11. I just can't think of the number right now, but we do have that number of how many. Uh, I appreciate you asking that question because our numbers of veterans in Wisconsin are declining. I think my intro tonight said 350,000 as of last fall. We're down to 345,000. And in five years, we're expected to be down to 300,000. As we advocate for veterans, and we're becoming a smaller and smaller population, I have great concern. Will people hear our voices? So thank you for bringing that up. And that you, if we had uh, forces for World War II and Vietnam, massive groups would go and massive groups would come back. These wars have been going on for almost 20 years. We have service members who have done nine, for example, tours. So thank you. It's, it's, we're putting people through a much different world than what has been in the past, and we need to be ready to serve them when they come home. I yeah. was going to bring that up on a secondary question. Our godson, uh, uh, first of all, he was in uh, New York at Ground Zero with the National Guard. That, that's where his unit was. Then he was deployed uh, to Afghanistan came home, deployed to Afghanistan, or Iraq, came home, and then deployed again. Mm -hmm. How long can you do that? Maybe that's more of a military question, but how, how long can you expect soldiers to go through that cycle? You bring up a person that exactly. went nine times. I, and I, I, we as a nation are learning that. How, how often can you do that? One of, a positive from a negative is we have had people who are separated because of whatever behavioral issue, uh, something happened and they were separated with a bad conduct discharge, a dishonorable discharge, and we are now as a nation with the federal VA, with veterans sitting down with the CVSO appealing to overturn that bad conduct discharge because there's recognition. This person did how many tours of it, deployments to either Iraq or Afghanistan, did multiple deployments, had traumatic brain injury, had PTSD. Are we surprised that we had a whatever kind of incident that was a very negative, unusual accident, but it happened after all these tours, people self-medicating with alcohol or other substances. We've, as a country, thankfully, are recognizing you have to look at what happened to that individual that led up to that incident. And I'm glad as a nation we do have people who are able to overturn that bad conduct discharge because people are able to see what led to that behavior. It, we have to deal with it as a I nation. saw the effect on him mm -hmm. after, uh, especially his third deployment. And uh, 
see that it still works with uh, the VA out in Washington, Good. D.C. now. But uh, there was a very bad period of time there for him, and I was hoping that he would not get called back. Actually. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, There's a 24 minutes left. Can you have a 24 month dwell time between the time you get back and the time that you get deployed again, unless you volunteer? If you volunteer within that 24 months, then then you can go back. But there's a yep. But there's a tw yep 24 month. Okay. What do you think about that? Oh, I see. I, uh, numerous and numerous deployments. Well, I've, I've, I've known I know the people that done at least nine nine tours. So um, I, I don't. It's it's it depends on the person really. I, and I think a lot of people do it for the monetary reasons, but for the financial reasons, because because of the the tax, you get a tax huge tax break, depending on how much rank you have. You know, a lot of people, sometimes it's really not that, you know, where you go, it's not that, you're not going to be in that type of, uh, not going to be in harm's way, yeah. right? You know, so the volatility of where you are. You know, like if you're a special forces guy, that's different. You know, you know, you're 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 in it every day. You know, but if you're or if you're uh, an infantryman, you're in it every day. If you're a radio guy, you're probably not going to be in it every day. Um, if you're on like where I was, you're on the road, you're you're a truck driver, you're going to be blowing up every day. Yeah, you know, that's that stuff that you don't want to be out there every day. I think also one of the things that is forgotten is just because we're friends and have seen it, is we also look at looking at the veterans, but then the families that are left home and to have to live with that on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's very difficult for me to understand all of these deployments and to see what it takes to be the, the wife, the mother who has to raise these children without a father or a mother, yep. both sides. I, I appreciate you bringing that up because that's exactly right when you said that. The monetary is like, okay, I'm going to take these orders again because we can afford this for our home and our, in a special, the, the personal choices that someone makes. I absolutely enjoyed my Navy career and I will did two tours in recruiting. I. I mentioned my background. So the military is known for being fast track to the middle class. You know, I, I don't know how my mom did it without actually going on welfare. Um, she took any job she could. So military service looked extremely attractive to me. And I'm, I believe you know, I helped people start a life that they chose in the military. But we as a nation, we have to look at what we've done. Uh, these wars, pardon? We've always done. Yeah, is this the right way to do it? I Answer me this, because so I've s supposed this, that if a person knows what they're getting into, they know, they got this, to use a term, street smarts, street smarts of that, instead of having the newbie that's never been there before. Aren't you usually afraid of the new person? Oh, but if you're with this person that's done this before, you're more comfortable. I think you're shaking your head. So, but yeah, but I, when I was on active duty, I don't know what it is now, but a third of the Army was deploying. Because I, I assume it's one, you, as you mentioned, uh, the specialty that you have, obviously, infantry is going to go. And then there's. Can we, can we yeah. talk about that? We go into yes. deep dive into that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, especially where I am right now, I, I, I see a lot of that. You know. That I can't get into this forum, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things happening that people don't know about. So, and and again, my concern about our low numbers: we're one percent of the American population. Less than when, 1%, yeah. and who knows about us? And it's somebody else, somebody else's kid, until it's not. Thank you for your. You said that uh, there were thirty thousand women veterans in Wisconsin. Can you uh, go back and compare your time 
in your early military life as a female compared to what you see today and, and what they deal with? Uh, so when I went to officer candidate school, we were, at the time, we were the largest post-Vietnam class. We started with 500. This kind of tells you how many people were kind of like rushed there. We finished with over 300. So the attrition was pretty high. And women were, uh, there, were there were about 30 of us. And 10 of those had the opportunity to go to sea. So I didn't have the opportunity <coughs> to go to sea as uh, I was commissioned in 1980. So it was tough. Graduated from UW Lacrosse. If you heard me stumble over my thing. Graduated from UW Cross three weeks later. I was at Officer Candidate School. Women are st still the minority. <coughs> Laura tells a little bit about her experience. There are things that are changed that you have more opportunities, but I am extremely disappointed as a human being that there are people who signed up to serve their country that are still uh, not viewed as an equal by their peers. That there's still, you know, again, it, to be deployed and worry literally about someone shooting you or blowing you up, but you got to worry about your fellow soldier who's got different ideas about how you should be used, not okay. So uh, it's, it's a reality, but again, in a heartbeat, I would do it again. I would, uh, but as definitely as a commissioned officer, I was always very concerned about the E1. So the military service, the most junior person in the military is an E1. Everybody is up to you. So what control do you have of your life? It's up to the seniors that are responsible for you to ensure your life, that you're treated as a soldier, as a sailor, as an airman, with respect. Not, you know, and if, if we're in Iraq and the enemy is the people shooting at us, not the person who's trying to take advantage of the situation. I don't know if that's <laughs> Is it, this might be too scientific of a question. Uh, is, is there a different challenge for a female veteran, the physiology, anything that would, where they have different programs that they need compared to a male veteran after the fact, whether it's PTSD or whatever they're dealing with after? Um, for veterans, when you have women who say, I'm not a veteran, it's like, yes, you are. You know, so it's not, again, it's usually I wasn't deployed or, it's like, no, you are a veteran. You have a DD-214, meets these standards, you know, you have a disability, whatever. It's just really irritating that for, you know, I don't have the scientific numbers, but for women, veterans are among the more likely veterans to say, I'm not really a veteran. Yes, you are. Uh, so again, I will just emphasize, in a heartbeat, I would join the military. I will recommend the military. But you ask the question, it's a reality that there are people who think they can take advantage physically. Uh, so when I went to officer candidate school, we got a book that says what the physical requirements were for the Navy's requirements. I made sure I could do the men because I could. And I did. And then I got away with it. I was running at the time, and I could run off the base. We weren't supposed to run off base. Nobody ever said a word to me because I was putting in the miles, physically fit, and I was recognized for my physical fitness. And I would say it was because I did the men's standards. So now when you know that there's women out there that have graduated Ranger School, uh, it's, it's phenomenal. We, when I was an instructor at Officer Indoctrination School, we used to have different sit-ups. You know, we had the women's sit-ups and the men's sit-ups. Within six weeks, we had women who had never done the men's um, push-ups before, and they could, because you tell them and you can get your mind. So I believe. Most of it is, yes, there's physiology. Yes, there's things that some people can't do. But I believe, man or woman, if you set your mind to it, it's amazing what people can do. So post-Vietnam, so post you had like Agent Orange. Thank you. Yep. Um, post 9-11, you had all the different types of cancers from all the different asbestos and everything that was going on. Is there any? specific type of cancer or anything like that, prostate cancer, lung cancer, that you are seeing through the VA system, through, you know, like the burn pits or, or anything else that you are seeing that's coming through? 
So it's probably what you're doing as well is reading and uh, what's been most forward in my mind lately is recognition by the federal VA of the Navy, the sailors who were impacted by Agent Orange. It's just started this January that they can apply for the claims for the medical conditions that are presumptive due to Agent Orange. I anticipate, this is just me, I'm not the federal VA, I'm not a medical person. What I'm reading is there's got to be acknowledgement of the burn pits. And then the other one I'm reading is about... <laughs> but you've seen them and experienced them. So, so. so what was happening, so what was happening was you go to these bases and they would throw everything in a burn pit, like everything. Everything. Would go in a burn pit. Like I was on LSA Anaconda, I'd run past it. I was putting on my miles every day. I'd run past it every day. And, and you were breathing. And you're breathing it. So, and you know, that's what the, so they're really not, the VA hasn't um, came out and actually said they're Correct. going to, to approve it. Um, it's, it's still going through Congress and appropriations. Correct. Um, so that's the big thing about the burn pit. They, they literally threw everything. In. And then, <coughs> you know, early in Vietnam, early in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, does early in OIF, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom, um, you were you were burning your own feces, feces um, with diesel fuel and mole gas, and you were in, you were inhaling all those fumes, you know. So that was another thing that you were doing. So, um, you know, been there, done that, done it all, done it all. So, um, but that's what the burn. That's what the burn. I mean, they were throwing oils. They were throwing. Anything and everything they were throwing. The first Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein just lit up the oil fields. Yep. Yeah. I so saw the people deployed and they're breathing that. 450 oil wells burning. The other things in the sand, um, we, we move very slowly as a nation to acknowledge what we've done to our military. But keep fighting. As the uh, VA secretary, what have you learned that you didn't expect to learn? What have you seen, or what has raised your eyebrows since you've been the secretary? So, f getting into the weeds now. So, uh, <laughs> I, as a Navy veteran, um, as a veteran, when I thought it looked pretty good for Governor Evers, I reached out to um, people on the transition team and said, hey, if you need help with WDVA finding a secretary, I'd like to help. And people would say, well, what about you, you know, about the I would think it was a third. I said, I need to apply. So here I am today. Uh, it's in the weeds now, but the department, when I got the binder, the turnover binder, if you will, and I saw our financial standing, I said, holy, what, what did I just get myself into? The Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs, we have three veterans' homes. We have uh, enough um, capacity for about 1,000 veterans between King, Union Grove, just about, it's 979, I think, today, but uh, between King, Union Grove, and <coughs> Chippewa Falls. The homes are 80% of our budget, and about 80% of the home's budget as personnel. We are skilled nursing. Some of you may know King, and the transition King, the Veterans Hospital at King was the Grand Army home uh, since 1887. It was created post-Civil War, but it has transitioned to skilled nursing. So I had to be much more informed about skilled nursing, and that has been a very eye-opening. And I, I got some feedback that somebody said, oh, she only cares about the homes. I care about every single veteran and their family members in the state. It's just I had to address the financial standing of our homes. The Wisconsin taxpayer dollars are paying for our homes, as is the federal government, Medicare and Medicaid. And that's why we are able to be successful is because of Medicare and Medicaid with our skilled nursing. As you hear um, other challenges for other people, nonprofits and profit, 
skilled nursing, the reason we are able to be as, as good a financial standing is because of Medicare and Medicaid for um, eligible veterans at our homes. But uh, for those of you, you've asked the question, for over a decade, we as a state took money from the homes to fund every other program that we have. Early in uh, the department's history, there was a liquor tax. How about that? And we must have gotten enough money and there's no longer a liquor tax. We had home loan programs. We don't have those anymore. So the only source of income for the department until this last year has been the homes. So literally money was taken from the homes to fund every other program. We couldn't financially do that. So when I met with senators and uh, representatives in the assembly, I said, we cannot continue on this path. I have been as fiscally frugal, conservative, whatever you call it, as I can be. I have upset some people because I've had to do a lot of changes, including at King, that's just this phenomenal place. But I've had to do it to get us back on financial standing. Thankfully, the state, Governor Evers, and bipartisan support of funding general uh, purpose revenue for the first time, instead of asking for a special appropriation or overspending, we did very well in the last budget, have funded the, funded the department. So we no longer have to take money from the homes to fund every other program. Is that enough detail for you? That's, that's my life for the department. But I'm, because of the homes. But when I hear the stories of our Veterans Outreach and Recovery Program, and they have literally prevented suicides, that's, that's why I'm in it. You know, I, for every veteran, when I hear education, just there's so many good stories about veterans in Wisconsin because we are a very, vener very generous state. To say, we, we also have cemeteries. We have three cemeteries. I didn't ever want anything to do with the cemetery. If you haven't seen our cemeteries, they are absolutely beautiful. And there's, uh, I'll give you another statistic. Um, Union Grove Cemetery is the fifth busiest cemetery in our nation. So, uh, but go see it if you haven't had a chance. Who does the service at that cemetery? Uh, WDVA staff, you know, for supporting. Burial in, in there, who does it like, like Arlington does, has the deal guard. Is there a, is there's, there a certain? There's an honor guard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sponsored by the Wisconsin WDVA. National Guard? Or? Uh, volunteers and I can get you more on that. Okay. But you should ask. And if you call 1 800 with vets, they can ask, answer that for you. I, th I, th I, th I think I've, I've met a few of those where they're just volunteer veterans who. It know did. when they're available. Yeah. And there's the honor guard, but there's also, I mean, if the word gets out, like people, through people like you, that there's a veteran without any family members, we have hundreds of people that will show up because they want to be there to say the final farewell to a veteran, even if that veteran doesn't have any family. I know we're getting a little uh, late on time. Any other questions for the secretary? I'm sure she'd be happy to stay afterward and take a couple one-on-one -on -one if you wanted. Uh, can I just ask, um, I know we got at least one, how many veterans are in the, in the room right now? One, two, three, four, five, And, and those that will self-identify, and that's okay. Yeah. You don't have to if you don't want to. So. Well, on behalf thank of the you. room, thank, thank you for your service. Yes, thank you. I, I will say thank you for your service. I know some of us, but it's like, I thank you, and I... Uh, the line is, we signed a blank check that went is for potentially even our lives. So I appreciate your service, and I appreciate everyone that supports Wisconsin veterans and their families. So thank you for being here tonight. Secretary Kolar, thank you. Yeah. And that will be posted on Washington Insider I'm sorry, WashingtonCountyInsider.com. So just in case someone wants to share that with someone else. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes uh, week two of the four week. I just wanna uh, thank once again to Candyman, uh, MCR Electrical Services, 
uh, Property Loss Management, Dunn Brothers Coffee, and the Washington County Fair Park and Conference Center. Uh, also, uh, uh, the, the sponsors of the live stream on WashingtonCountyInsider.com, West Bend Elevator, uh, Property Loss Management, Maury's West Bend Honda, and Colette Systems. At this time, uh, we've got a video uh, for the uh, Wisconsin 9-11 uh, Memorial, and uh, we're going to show that right now. It's a, I think it's about an eight-minute video, Gordon? Yes. Okay. So you're uh, free to watch this or take off. Uh, thank you very much for coming. This is at the World Trade Center. There has been some sort of explosion. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. Apparently, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center in New York. Another passenger plane hitting the World Trade Center. And you can see the two towers, a huge explosion now, raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. On September 11th, 2001, terrorists attacked the United States on its own soil. They hijacked four planes and used them as weapons to do the unthinkable. The attack obliterated the iconic Twin Towers and crushed all the buildings on the 16-acre Trade Center site. It severely damaged the Pentagon and our nation's capital. And United Airlines Flight 93 forcibly crashed in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. In all, 2,977 people died that day. And the number keeps rising as those who rushed in to help the first responders, firefighters, police officers, and volunteers are now battling deadly diseases caused by long-term exposure to ground zero and their tireless recovery efforts. The horrific events that took place on September 11th changed America forever. But it also united us like never before. Our country came together and helped family and friends in their greatest time of despair. Among the victims, 17 people with Wisconsin ties, including a young woman from the small town of Farmington. Andrea Haberman, a graduate of Kewaskum High School and St. Norbert College, was in New York that day for the first business trip of her career. Just 25 years old, Andrea took her first and last elevator ride to the 92nd floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Andrea knew no one in New York. It's just so sad. Pretty shy, but uh, she had a quiet power to her. She was a character. Super smart, just full of life. Full of life. Had worked hard to get where she was. We know where she was standing in the building. We know who she was talking to in the building when the plane hit. They were frantic inside that building. They were desperate. Our goal was to find her daughter and bring her home. It was just complete and total carnage. And the smell, there's, there's never been a smell like the smell at ground zero. The fires were still burning. I, the place was hellish. You're supposed to kind of um, maybe forget or I can't. The events of September 11th, its aftermath, and Andrea's story inspired the village of Kewaskum to acquire an artifact from the North Tower for a 9-11 memorial. Using that artifact as a centerpiece, it has evolved into what will be one of the finer 9-11 memorials in the country. Peter Kudlata of Flagstone Landscaping in Cedarburg designed it to be a place of reflection, education, and respect a monument built to withstand the test of time, to honor those lost on September 11th and all who have served in the resulting conflicts. That's what the memorial is about, to remember all of those people that helped America rebuild. 18 years later, a milestone event. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers signed State Senate Bill 433 it designates the section of Highway 28 from Highway 41 to Highway 144 as the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial Highway. The inclusion of the memorial on the Wisconsin map will make it a destination for those who want to remember and learn about the events of September 11, 2001. 
It'll also highlight the extraordinary response and dedication of our first responders and showcase the sacrifices made by our military servicemen and women. We've accomplished a great deal over the last few years. The monument is now starting to take shape, but we still have work to do. We're almost 19 years after an event that changed the course of history of this country, and we're forgetting. On 9-11, I was ready to go out the door and I had Andrea's little pin on. And Mia asked me, can I wear that to school today? And she came home and she said, I told people about my aunt. You know, and I think that's so important about the memorial because people need to remember how America came together and how we have moved forward, but also the people that don't know anything about it. It's not about Andrea. We've never looked at the memorial as a memorial to her. Please, please help us get this memorial built. It's your memorial too. It's Wisconsin's. We need this. We're in the process of raising the remaining funds needed and securing strategic partnerships to ensure the memorial is finished according to plan. It is our hope that the newly designated Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial Highway will guide visitors from near and far to Kewaskum and to Washington County. To complete this project, we're looking for the American spirit of compassion and generosity to continue. Please consider how you can help support make the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial and Education Center a reality. The memorial will showcase the strength of America, the strength of our communities, the power and the compassion that American people are capable of. Together, we will never forget. All right, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. One more hand for Secretary Kohler. All right, thanks, grab a cookie on the way out, and have a safe drive home. <laughs>